welcome to another edition of the UK Law Weekly Podcast with me, your host, Marcus Cleaver. This week we're going to be looking at the case of Vedanta Resources PLC and Lungo. And the citation for this case is 2019 UKSC 20. The case that we will be looking at this week only has a tangential relationship with England, as the main issue is to do with Zambia. The respondent, Lungo, lives in the Copper Belt province of Zambia, and as the name suggests, the region is very popular for mining copper. At the heart of this case is the Enchanga copper mine, which, it is alleged, has been the source for toxic emissions into the water supply. This has had an especially deleterious effect on Lungo's local community, as they are very poor anyway, and rely on that water for drinking purposes, as well as for farming. With toxins seeping into the water since 2005, there has been a significant impact on public health and the local economy. And so Lungo, alongside 1,825 other local citizens, decided to bring legal action against the owners of the mine. At this point you are probably wondering what any of this has to do with the UK, and in order to understand this we need to delve into the corporate structure of the mine. In the first instance it is owned by Concola Copper Mines PLC, a Zambian company who we will refer to as KCM. However their parent company is the first appellant in this case, Vedanta Resources PLC, and they are incorporated and domiciled in the United Kingdom, hence the link. Whether that link back to the UK is strong enough is at the heart of this jurisdiction case, and we can start off by noting the salient point that the government of Zambia has a significant minority interest in KCM, and yet Vedanta itself claims in official documentation that it exercises ultimate control over KCM. The best way to think of this jurisdiction case then is that while the substance of the claim remains consistent in the sense that it is about the toxic emissions, the nature of the claim against Vedanta is dependent upon that company exercising significant control over the mining operations carried out by KCM, including their responsibility in relation to health and environmental standards alongside its status as a UK company. There is a legal basis for this claim by virtue of EU law, and in particular the so-called Recast Brussels Regulation from 2012. Regulation 4.1 states, quote, Subject to this regulation, persons domiciled in a member state shall, whatever their nationality, be sued in the courts of that member state, end quote. Meanwhile, the claim against KCM is dependent on that company actually operating the mine. Of course, KCM is actually based in Zambia, and so the legal foundation is slightly different. The claimants rely on the civil procedure rules, and in particular paragraph 3.1 of the Practice Direction 6b, which states that KCM can be a defendant where they are a, quote, necessary or proper party. When both Vedanta and KCM sought to challenge the jurisdiction, they were unsuccessful in both the High Court and the Court of Appeal and so the case progressed to the Supreme Court, which is where we pick it up. For the justices, there were four key issues that had to be dealt with in this case, and so it makes sense for us to also go through these in turn. The first one related to the recast Brussels regulation that we just mentioned as the legal basis for the claim against Vedanta. In particular, the question was whether it was an abuse of EU law to essentially use Regulation 4 as the start of a chain. What we mean by this is that Regulation 4 was really only used as a pretense to pull KCM into the case via Vedanta, because if they did not do this then there would not be a case available in the UK at all. The justices responded to this by noting that in actual fact, the availability of jurisdiction over KCM probably was a contributing factor to the decision to bring proceedings against Vedanta. Nevertheless, to construe this as some sort of abuse of law is going too far. EU jurisprudence in the area of abuse of law is altogether very restrictive, and so really the only way that the appellants would be able to succeed on this first issue is if the only reason that the case against Vedanta was brought was to get it KCM. Meanwhile, previous case law on the recast Brussels regulations, such as Awusu and Jackson from 2005, 
suggests that Regulation 4 is a relatively powerful provision, and that the English courts would have to have very good reasons for declining jurisdiction, for example if doing so would subvert other principles of EU law. Therefore, because Lungo and the other claimants had a genuine reason for invoking Regulation 4, they were successful on this first issue. The second issue is almost partially linked to the first in the sense that it seeks to undercut the entire proceedings by challenging the case brought against the UK-based company Vedanta. However, instead of looking towards an abuse of EU law, the appellants this time question whether there is an actual case that has been made out against Vedanta by the claimants. In other words, we need to look purely at the claim itself and identify on the facts whether there was sufficient intervention by Vedanta in the operation of the mine. When the Supreme Court looked at how this had been approached by the trial judge, they could find no problem at all with the assessment that there was an arguable case, and all of the evidence seemed to support this. Furthermore, the justices took the opportunity to note that there was no problem with the fact a negligence claim was being brought against a parent company in respect of the actions of its subsidiary nor that this could be looked at as part of the summary determination of the claim. With no success on the first two issues, the appellants moved to their next argument, which was whether England was indeed the proper place to bring the claims. You may be tempted to think that based on what we have already discussed, that this had already been answered, but really, all that this has told us so far is that England is certainly an option alongside Zambia. What the court is being asked to evaluate in this instance is, based on a range of factors, whether England or Zambia is the most appropriate jurisdiction. The Supreme Court began by looking at the approach of the lower courts, and in particular their implementation of the idea that a primary claim against a defendant in England will swing the balancing exercise decisively towards the English jurisdiction. The reasoning behind this is that if the courts didn't do this, then it would lead to issues if there ended up being irreconcilable judgments between different jurisdictions in a single case. Applying English law across the board would ensure consistency and not lead to subsequent proceedings after the trial. For the justices, the logic behind this was fine, but its application did not make much sense when we bear in mind that Vedanta had offered to be subject to Zambian jurisdiction. All of this meant that we ended up in a situation where Vedanta were happy to be subject to Zambian jurisdiction, KCM were happy to be subject to Zambian jurisdiction, and yet the courts decided that consistency demanded that the case be tried in England. Of course, we can look back to Regulation 4, which tells us that the claimants can elect to sue a company in the jurisdiction in which they are domiciled. But remember, this isn't really telling us anything about what we should do when faced with the possibility of irreconcilable judgments, especially when one of the parties is based outside of the European Union. If this did become a problem, then it would only really affect the claimants, as they would likely struggle to have a judgment in their favour realised. But at the same time, the ball is in their court, and they could avoid the issue by agreeing to bring the claim in Zambia instead. In the end, the justices decided that while the lower courts had treated the possibility of irreconcilable judgments as a be-all and end-all, it was only really one of a number of factors to take into account as part of a wider balancing exercise. When that exercise was carried out properly, it soon became clear that Zambia was in fact the proper place for this litigation to take place in. So is that it then? If Zambia is the proper place, do Vedanta succeed in their appeal? Well, the keen-eared amongst you will remember that there were actually four issues to discuss, so before we get ahead of ourselves, let's look at this final issue. In fact, the fourth issue is somewhat related to the third, because while we now know that Zambia is the appropriate place for the litigation to take place in, that does not tell us whether substantial justice will be achieved there. If it can be shown that this would not be possible, then it may still be ordered for England to have jurisdiction. The main concern about the Zambian justice system is around access to justice. If you recall the opening to this episode, Lungo and the other claimants are all very poor and live off the land. In many ways, that provided the reason for them bringing this case in the first place. In England, this isn't really an issue because the claimants could use something like a conditional fee agreement to avoid having to pay up front. 
Unfortunately, not only is that option not available in Zambia, but such arrangements are also illegal. A further point was made that the legal teams in Zambia are neither experienced enough nor well resourced enough to actually deal with a case of this size or complexity. To conclude this judgment then, it was decided that although Zambia was the appropriate place for the litigation to take place in, because of these endemic issues affecting the legal culture, it is in fact better for the trial to be held in the UK. So as we move on to our own analysis of this case, what can we actually take from it? Well, I think on the first two points, the reasoning of the Supreme Court proves to be fairly sound. It is pretty clear that one of the main reasons that Vedanta are a defendant in this case is because of their domicile in the UK. At that point, it might have been easy for a court to therefore make a finding against the claimant for essentially using Regulation 4 as a loophole for the case as a whole. However, it probably would have been going too far to refer to this as an abusive process when it is really just about using the legal system to gain the best possible advantage. On the other hand, the third and fourth issues, which we will also group together, do present some problems. The resolution of the third issue on its own is pretty much fine because a balancing exercise between England and Zambia is needed and the use of Regulation 4 to try and anchor the case in the UK should not be enough to put a stop to further analysis of relevant factors. The problem is that this is rendered almost completely academic by the decision on the fourth issue that holds substantive justice could not be achieved in Zambia anyway, so jurisdiction therefore reverts to England. The question that I would pose is why this issue of substantive justice should not form part of the overall balancing exercise, as it is clearly a relevant factor. In the end, this might be a legitimate way to separate out a question that is a much harder yes-no from some of the more legalistic questions based on the facts of the case, but it does also conveniently allow the justices to overrule the 2013 case of OJSC and Parline Limited without it impacting the final decision here. Nevertheless, the main criticism of this fourth issue is the notion that Zambia is somehow unfit to deal with a case of this magnitude. The expression of this in a legal judgment smacks of neo-colonialism, and the idea that it is the white, well-educated Westerner that knows best, and therefore the Africans should instead shut up and listen, is pretty abhorrent when considered in those terms. What makes this even worse is that the judgment even highlights some of the best aspects of the Zambian justice system that, in terms of the rule of law, appears to match its British counterpart. For example, the fact that the government has a minority interest in the mining company is not cited as a cause for concern because of the independence enjoyed by judges in Zambia, as well as across the legal system as a whole. Instead, there are two points that are raised. The first is around access to justice for those in a weak financial position, and in particular the limited availability of legal aid and the impossibility of obtaining a conditional fee agreement. That may all be true, but it is hard to think that litigants in the UK are in a much better position, given the attacks on access to justice in the wake of the Legal Aid, Sentencing and Punishment of Offenders Act 2012. There is still a great degree of uncertainty in this area, and it would be difficult to guarantee that claimants in this position will be immune from the cuts. Conditional fee agreements are one way around this, and it is certainly true that this option enjoys much more life in the UK rather than Zambia. But this is not the only funding arrangement that exists. For example, private funding of legal claims may be an option, and crowdsourcing is becoming increasingly popular in this field. In any case, it is hard to know how much of a factor this should be in a decision that, when it comes down to it, is really just about jurisdiction. By contrast, we do not see domestic divorce proceedings suspended because of the limited availability of legal aid in the area of family law. The second point is almost too insulting to mention because it directly calls into question the skills and expertise of Zambian legal professionals. Even just saying this out loud, it's hard not to hear the racial undertone of that message from the Supreme Court. I don't even think that this is deliberate. It is certainly not well thought through. Unless they have tested and assessed the legal professionals across the country, it seems difficult to justify this broad generalisation. It is here that the real neo-colonialism comes to the fore, as the implication of the judgment is clear. The Zambian people cannot be trusted to run this case on their own, 
and thus require the assistance of the benevolent white man, this is not exactly a wonderful advertisement for the English judiciary, and to be honest there is plenty to sort out in our own backyard before we begin to nanny foreign jurisdictions. Well thank you very much for tuning into this episode and thanks as ever to bensound.com who provide the theme music. Special thanks to everyone who takes the time to rate and review the podcast on iTunes as well as their other podcast apps. Special thanks this week goes to JenKirk99 who left a wonderful review of the podcast on iTunes. Thank you very much to you. I'll be back with another case next week, but for now, bye!